June 25th. We are informed that our infantry and artillery with small detachments of cavalry are advancing through Maryland to meet and repel the invaders, who are reported to be crossing the Potomac in two heavy columns at Shepherdstown and Williamsport. Every department of the service seems to be in commotion and great things are expected. A heavy rain set in early this evening. At six o'clock on the morning of June 26th, we broke camp at Aldi and advanced towards Leesburg, spending the night near this place. Most of our time has been spent in the saddle. This is becoming not only our seat, but also our bed and pillow. Our corps commenced its march towards Edwards Ferry on the Potomac at five o'clock a.m. of June 27th. On our way to the ferry, we crossed the famous battlefield of Ball's Bluff, where Colonel Baker and many of his gallant Californians became an early and costly sacrifice to the cause of the Union. On reaching the river, we found the two pontoon bridges, over which already a large portion of our array had passed on before us. They had been much retarded by the heavy rains and mud. The approaches to the pontoons had been so trodden by the myriad feet of men and beasts, and cut by the heavy wheels of laden wagons and artillery, that we found the roads almost bottomless. But as we had seen mud many times before, we moved forward. Undis. Dismayed, though somewhat retarded, and were soon on northern soil. A somewhat strange feeling came over us on finding ourselves marching mainly towards the North Star to meet the enemy, whereas we had so long been accustomed to look and march only southward for this purpose. Our march lay through a fine and fertile section of country. The vast fields of grain are ripening for the harvest, and their appearance indicates that thus far the labors of the husbandman have not been in vain. The peacefulness of the fields and flocks presents a striking contrast to the warlike preparations, which are now being made for what must be the most decisive and bloody contest of the war. The rebellion seems to have risked its very existence in the coming conflict, which cannot be many days hence. Determination and desperation seem foremost in the movement. On our side, a solemn decision seems to be actuating the masses. We know that should the stars and bars be victorious again, and at this crisis of our national affairs, as they were at the two bull run battles, and at Chancellorsville, our stars and stripes will not only be shamefully humbled, but suffer cruel elimination. In such an event, some of our stars must fall, and some of the beams of our light must be obscured. But conquer we must, for our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave, o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Sunday, June 28th. All night long we were on the march, arriving in the vicinity of Frederick City early in the morning. The whole country for miles seems to be covered with soldiers. This is one of the most beautiful spots in the world. However, the city does not show the thrift and prosperity which are evidenced in northern cities enjoying similar advantages. This is the capital of Frederick County, one of the richest in the state. Looking southward from the city, we behold an almost interminable stretch of beautiful rolling land, nearly every inch of which is not only arable but richly productive. On the east, at a distance of several miles, the eye rests upon a range of hills which sweep downward toward the Potomac, terminating in the lofty peak called Sugarloaf. Westward rises the loftier chain of the Catoctin, which is but a continuation of the Bull Run Mountains, severed by the river at Point of Rocks. All the highest peaks of these hills and mountains are now used for signal stations, where wave the signal flags by day and flash the signal fires by night. One seldom wearies in watching these operations, though he may not understand their significance. This has been a day of much interest among us and of no little excitement, a day of changes and reorganization. An exciting rumor was bandied from man to man this morning that General Hooker was about to be relieved from the command of the Grand Army, and the day was only partly spent when the strange rumor resolved itself into the astounding truth. The facts which led to this result may not be perfectly understood among us, but appear to be about as follows. On discovering that the enemy had actually invaded the northern states, General Hooker requested the authorities 
to send him all the forces which could be spared from General Heintzelman's command in and about the defenses of Washington. This was done. But having crossed the Potomac, General Hooker visited Harper's Ferry with its strong garrison and immediately urged upon the government the importance of placing this force also under his command. Upon this subject there sprang up a sharp controversy between Hooker and Halleck. The latter rejoined to the former in these words, Maryland Heights have always been regarded as an important point to be held by us, and much expense and labor incurred in fortifying them. I cannot approve of their abandonment, except in case of absolute necessity. General Hooker's reply to this shows him to have been in the right and to have comprehended the relative importance of the position in question. I have received your telegram in regard to Harper's Ferry. I find 10,000 men here in condition to take the field. Here they are of no earthly account. They cannot defend a ford of the river, and so far as Harper's Ferry is concerned, there is nothing of it. As for the fortifications, the work of the troops, they remain when the troops are withdrawn. This is my opinion. All the public property could have been secured tonight, and the troops marched to where they could have been of some service. Now they are but a bait for the rebels, should they return. I beg that this may be presented to the Secretary of War and His Excellency, the President. Receiving no direct reply to this announcement and goaded by the pressure of fast-moving events, our general yielded to do what many of us heartily condemn by sending the following message, Sandy Hook, M.D., to June 27, 1863. Major General H.W. Halleck, General-in-Chief. My original instructions require me to cover Harper's Ferry and Washington. I have now imposed upon me, in addition, an enemy in my front of more than my numbers. I beg to be understood respectfully, but firmly, that I am unable to comply with this condition, with the means at my disposal, and earnestly request that I may at once be relieved from the position I occupy. Joseph Hooker, Major General Today came the order relieving General Hooker, who issued the following characteristic farewell address to the troops, many of whom were taken wholly by surprise, and all of them appeared greatly afflicted. Headquarters Army of the Potomac Frederick, Mad, June 28, 1863 In conformity with the orders of the War Department, dated June 27, 1863, I relinquish the command of the Army of the Potomac. It is transferred to Major General George G. Meade, a brave and accomplished officer who has nobly earned the confidence and esteem of the Army on many a well-fought field. Impressed with the belief that my usefulness as the commander of the Army of the Potomac is impaired, I part from it, yet not without the deepest emotions. The sorrow of parting with the comrades of so many battles is relieved by the conviction that the courage and devotion of this Army will never cease nor fail, that it will yield to my successor, as it has to me, a willing and hearty support. With the earnest prayer that the triumph of this army may bring successes worthy of it and the nation, I bid it farewell. Joseph Hooker, Major General Such a change of regime on the eve of a great battle, with the command in the hands of one less known and trusted, at first seemed to threaten disaster but the modest, earnest words with which the new commander framed his first order to the troops allayed all fears, renewed confidence, and greatly attached to him the hearts of his subordinates. Headquarters Army of the Potomac June 28, 1863 By direction of the President of the United States, I hereby assume command of the Army of the Potomac. As a soldier, in obeying this order, an order totally unexpected and unsolicited, I have no promises or pledges to make. The country looks to this army to relieve it from the devastation and disgrace of a hostile invasion. Whatever fatigues and sacrifices we may be called to undergo, let us have in view constantly the magnitude of the interests involved, and let each man determine to do his duty, leaving to an all-controlling providence the decision of the contest. It is with just diffidence that I relieved in the command of this army an eminent and accomplished soldier, whose name must ever appear conspicuous in the history of its achievements. But I rely upon the hearty support of my companions in arms 
to assist me in the discharge of the duties of the important trust which has been confided to me. George G. Meade, Major General Commanding. This change of commanders was followed by others in various branches of the service, not excepting the Cavalry Corps. Our force has been increased by General Julius Stahill's division, which has been employed for some time in the vicinity of Fairfax Courthouse and along the line of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. In the reorganization, the Corps, which continues under the efficient command of General Pleasanton, is arranged into three divisions, the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, commanded respectively by Generals Buford, Gregg, and Kilpatrick. A more effective cavalry force was never organized on this continent, and probably on no other. The Harris Light is assigned to General Gregg's division, which separates us for the first time from our former beloved commander. But we are not among those who desire to shirk responsibility for any such cause as this. After the division had been reorganized and reviewed, in the afternoon we took up our line of march to New Market. Some rain fell towards night, which laid the dust and allayed the heat. Men and horses are living well upon the rich products of the country. Upon such supplies we rely mainly, though our trains are not wholly destitute. We are received with more or less enthusiasm and demonstrations of patriotism in nearly all the towns we visit, making a very striking contrast with our former receptions in cities and towns of Virginia. This gives our men additional courage and nerves us for the conflicts impending. June 29th We have been in the saddle nearly all day scouting the country in the neighborhood of Westminster. On the morning of the 30th, about nine o'clock, the regiment entered this pleasant town, the citizens flocking from all directions to pay us their respects and to show their devotion to the cause of the Union. After a short halt, we advanced to Manchester. On the 1st of July, we marched to Hanover Junction, Pennsylvania, where we met the enemy's cavalry under General John Jenkins, and after a spirited skirmish, they were forced to retire. The Pennsylvanians welcomed us with glad cheers and showed their appreciation of our presence and services by driving several huckster's wagons into our midst, well laden with a great variety of eatables, which were donated to us by the good citizens of the surrounding country. It is true that some of the inhabitants made their gifts very sparingly and not without grudging, while others charged enormous prices for such articles as we were willing to purchase, but justice demands that we state that such inhospitable, unpatriotic, and niggardly souls were the exception. While here we learned the particulars of important movements made by other portions of our cavalry. Kilpatrick, with his vigorous division, left the vicinity of Frederick on Monday, and, striking northward, he passed through Taney Town, reaching Littletown about ten o'clock at night, where he was received in the midst of great rejoicing. A large group of children and young ladies, gaily attired on the balcony of a hotel, waving handkerchiefs and flags, greeted their defenders with patriotic songs, while the heroic troopers responded with cheers which made the welkin ring. The command bivouacked in the vicinity of the village, where the citizens brought abundant forage for the horses and the cavalrymen rested till morning. The march was then resumed in the direction of Hanover, the column, which was several miles in length, entered this beautiful town and was passing through while the citizens were regaling the men sumptuously from their bountifully provided larders and interchanging friendly and patriotic greetings, neither party suspecting the presence of the enemy. Nearly one half the column had already passed through, when suddenly the quiet social scene was disturbed by the opening of a rebel battery concealed on a wood-crowned hill and so posted as to rake a portion of the road upon which the Union forces entered the town. This was immediately followed by a charge of rebel cavalry, which had been drawn up in line of battle just behind a chain of hills which ran near and parallel to the highway. There they had quietly waited until the train was passing before them, with the hope that this might be captured or stampeded, and a glorious victory be won. General Stuart commanded in person, and the attack was certainly well planned. But Kilpatrick's boys were not to be disconcerted nor panic-stricken by any such or any other trap. The main force of the charging column happened to be in the rear of the 5th New York, commanded by Major Hammond. 
quick work was necessary. Rapidly moving out of the street into the open park near the railroad depot, Major Hammond drew his regiment in line of battle, and in nearly as short time as it takes to record it, charged with drawn sabers the rebels, who then possessed the town. The charging columns met on Frederick Street, where a fierce and bloody hand-to-hand -hand contest ensued. For a few moments the enemy made heroic resistance, but soon broke and fled, closely pursued. They rallied again and again as fresh regiments came to their aid, but they were met, hurled back, and pursued with irresistible onsets, which compelled them to retire not only from the town, but also behind the hills under cover of their batteries. In less than fifteen minutes from the time the rebels charged into the village, they were driven from it, leaving the streets strewn with their dead men and horses, and the debris which always accompanies such a conflict. The dead of both parties lay promiscuously about the street, so covered with blood and dust as to render identification in some cases very difficult. The blue of the Union and the gray of rebellion were almost entirely obliterated, and in many instances the contending parties mingled their blood in one common pool. This work of destruction had but just commenced when Generals Kilpatrick and Farnsworth, who, though some miles distant at the head of the column when the booming cannon announced the bloody fray, arrived in hot haste and took personal charge of the movements. These were ordered with consummate skill and executed with promptness and success. Elder's battery, well posted on the hills facing. The rebels, and well supported, soon silenced the guns of the enemy and drove him in the direction of Lee's main army. He was thoroughly punished for his audacious attack and left many dead, wounded, and captured. The colors of the 13th Virginia Cavalry were captured by a sergeant of the 5th New York. About 75 prisoners beside the wounded fell into our hands, including Lieutenant Colonel Payne, who commanded a brigade. The particulars of his capture are worthy of historic record. In one of the charges made in the edge of the town, one of our boys, by the name of Abram Folger, was captured by Colonel Payne and marched toward the rear. Just outside the town was a large brick tannery, the vats of which were not under cover, and close alongside of the highway. Folger was walking beside the colonel's orderly. As they approached the tan vats, he espied a carbine lying on the ground. Quick as thought, he seized it, fired, and killed Payne's horse. The animal, in his death struggle, plunged over towards the vats, and Payne was thrown headlong into one of them, being completely submerged in the tan liquid. Folger, feeling that the colonel was secure enough for the moment, leveled his piece on the orderly, who, finding that his pistol was fouled and hence useless, attempted to jump his horse over the fence, but not succeeding, surrendered. It happened, however, that Folger had expended the last shot in the carbine on the colonel's horse. But as the orderly did not know it, it was just as well for Folger as though more ammunition had been on hand. The recently made prisoner was compelled to assist his colonel from the vat. His gray uniform, with white velvet trimmings, his white gauntlets, and his face and hair had received a brief but thorough tanning. Folger marched the two in front of him to the marketplace in the center of the village, where he delivered his captives to the authorities. In one hand, the brave soldier boy carried his empty carbine, and in the other, a good strong stick. It was a most ludicrous and interesting scene. Folger was captured by Payne's command in Virginia, the winter before this affair, and his feelings may be imagined at having so nicely returned the compliment. The citizens of Hanover, who so nobly cared for our wounded in the hospitals during and after the battle, and assisted us in burying our dead, will not soon forget that terrible last day of June. Our brave boys, who, though taken by surprise, had so valiantly defeated the enemy, built their bivouac fires, and rested for the night on the field of their recent victory. Stuart's cavalry was now losing caste, while our troopers were not only adding fresh laurels to their chaplet of renown, but also new fibers of vitality to the hearts and hands which loved and defended the sacred tree of liberty. General Buford, with his division, had moved from Frederick City directly to Gettysburg, the capital of Adams County, a rural village of about 3,000 inhabitants, beautifully situated among the hills, which, though quite lofty, are generally well cultivated. 
the general found the burrow very quiet and passed through. But he had not proceeded far beyond before he met the van of the rebel army under General Heth of Hill's Corps. The dauntless troopers charged furiously the invading hordes and drove them back upon their supports, where our boys were driven back in their turn before overwhelming numbers. As Providence would have it, our infantry advance, under General James S. Wadsworth, marching from the village of Emmitsburg, hearing the familiar sound of battle, went into a double-quick, and, hastening through Gettysburg, struck the advancing rebel column just in time to seize and occupy the range of hills that overlooks the place from the northwest in the direction of Chambersburg. General John F. Reynolds, a true Pennsylvanian, was in command of our entire advance, which consisted of the 1st and 11th Corps, about 22,000 strong. As General Wadsworth was placing his division in position, General Reynolds went forward quite alone to reconnoiter when he discovered a heavy force of the enemy in a grove not far distant. Dismounting quickly, he crouched down by a fence through which he sought to survey the forcey and its position by means of his field glass when a whistling ball from a sharpshooter's musket struck him in the neck. He fell on his face and baptized with his lifeblood the soil which had given him birth. His untimely fall, especially at this crisis and almost in sight of his childhood's home, was generally lamented. His lifeless form was borne away to the rear, just as the rebels in heavy force advanced upon not more than one-third their number. General Abner Doubleday had to assume command of our forces under this galling fire, having arrived with a portion of the First Corps, the remainder of which and the Eleventh Corps, not being able to join them until two hours of fearful destruction had gone on. Our feeble advance was compelled to fall quickly back upon Seminary Hill, just west of the village, and were pursued very closely, so much so that one portion of our line, seeing its opportunity, swung around rapidly, enveloping the rebel advance and capturing General Archer the leader, and about eight hundred prisoners. On the arrival of the Eleventh Corps, General O. O. Howard, being the ranking officer present, assumed command, giving his place to General Carl Schurz. Our men, now emboldened by these fresh arrivals of helpers and having alighted upon a fine commanding position, renewed the fight with spirit and wonderful success. This prosperous tide of things continued until about one o'clock p.m., when their right wing was assailed furiously by fresh troops, which proved to be General Ewell's corps, which had been marching from York, directed by the thunder of battle. Thus flanked and outnumbered by the gathering hosts, the Eleventh Corps, which was most exposed to the enfilading fire of the newly arrived columns, began to waver, then to break, and soon fled in perfect rout. The First Corps was thus compelled to follow, or be annihilated. The two retreating columns met and mingled in more or less confusion in the streets of the town, where they greatly obstructed each other, though the First Corps retained its organization quite unbroken. In passing through the town, the Eleventh Corps was especially exposed to the fire of the enemy, who pressed his advantage and captured thousands of prisoners. Our wounded who, up to this time, had been quartered in Gettysburg, fell into the enemy's hands, and scarcely one half of our brave boys, who had so recently and proudly passed through the streets to the battle lines, had the privilege of returning, but either lay dead or dying on the well-fought fields, or were captives with a cruel foe. The number of killed and wounded showed how desperately they had fought, and the large number captured was evidence of the overwhelming numbers with which they had contended. General Buford with his troopers covered our retreat, showing as bold a front as possible to the enemy, who, it was feared, would follow fiercely, as they were very strong and several hours of daylight yet remained. But doubtless, fearing that a trap might be laid for them if they advanced too far, they contented themselves with only a portion of the borough, their main force occupying the hills which form a grand amphitheater on the north and west. It would be difficult to refrain from saying that those rebel forces were prevented from advancing by some mighty unseen hand, the hand of him who watches over the destiny of nations. Our feeble and decimated forces took possession of Cemetery Hill, south of the town, and being reinforced by General Sickles' Corps, 
they began to entrench themselves with earthworks and rifle pits, to extend their lines to right and left, and to select the best positions for our batteries. This work was continued quite late into the evening, the broad moonlight greatly facilitating the operations. General Meade, who had selected his ground for the impending battle along the banks of Pipe Creek, and who at one o'clock p.m. was at Taneytown when the news of the fight and the death of the brave Reynolds at Gettysburg reached him, dispatched General Hancock to the scene of conflict to take command and to ascertain whether Gettysburg afforded better ground than that which had been selected. Hancock arrived at Cemetery Hill just as our broken lines were hastily and confusedly retreating from the village. Our advance, however, had already taken this commanding position and was making some preparation for resistance. The newly arrived general began at once to order the forces which had been engaged and others which were occasionally arriving. He ordered the occupancy of Culp's Hill on our extreme right and extended the lines to our left well up the high ground in the vicinity of Round Top, a rocky eminence about two miles from Gettysburg and nearly equidistant from the Emmitsburg and Tainay Town roads. The line having been made as secure as possible, Hancock wrote to Meade that the position was excellent. His dispatch had scarcely gone when he was relieved by General Slocum, a ranking officer, and so, leaving the field, Hancock hastened to report in person to his chief the condition of things at Gettysburg. On arriving, Meade informed him that he had decided to fight at Gettysburg and had sent orders to the various commands to that effect. Then together they rode to Gettysburg, arriving about eleven o'clock at night. All night long our forces were concentrating before this historic village, where they were all found on the morning of the 2nd of July, except the 6th Corps, General Sedgwick's, which did not arrive until two o'clock in the afternoon, after marching nearly all the previous night. Until three o'clock all was quiet along the battle lines, except an occasional picket or sharpshooter's fire. However, there had been considerable maneuvering. On our left, General Sickles, in his eagerness for a fight, had advanced his corps across the Emmitsburg Road and on a wood-crowned ridge in the immediate vicinity of the main portion of the rebel army. General Meade, in his inspection of the lines, remonstrated against the perilous position which Sickles had taken the liberty to gain. He, however, intimated that, if desired, he would withdraw to the ridge which Meade had justly indicated as the proper place where our forces would be better protected and would be able to cover Round Top, a point which it was considered essential to retain. General Meade thereupon expressed his fear to Sickles that the enemy would not permit him quietly to retire from the trap in which he had placed his foot. And the last words had scarcely fallen from his lips when the rebel batteries were opened with fearful accuracy and at short range, and the infantry came on with their fierce charging yell. General Longstreet was in command. With so long and strong lines of infantry in his front, which lapped over his flanks on either side, and a fearful enfilading fire from the heavy batteries on Seminary Hill, Sickles and his brave men were torn, shattered, overwhelmed, and with terrible loss and in great confusion fell back to the ridge from which he ought not to have advanced. In the struggle the rebels made a desperate attempt to reach and possess Round Top, which they came near doing before General Sykes, who had been ordered to advance and hold it, had gained the elevation. But their failure to possess this coveted prize proved a great disaster, for before they could withdraw their charging columns across the plain between Round Top and the ridge where Sickles stood at the beginning of the fray, they were attacked by General Hancock with a heavy force and driven almost like chaff before the wind. Their loss was terrible. At the close of this encounter, our lines stood precisely where General Meade desired they should be before the fight commenced, with Round Top fully in our possession and now strongly fortified with heavy artillery and good infantry support. On our right, General Ewell had succeeded in pushing back some portions of our lines under Slocum, who occupied Culp's Hill, and some of our fortified lines and rifle pits were occupied by the rebels. Night came on to close the dreadful day. Thus far the battle had been mostly in the advantage of the rebels. They held the ground where Reynolds had fallen, also Seminary Ridge, and the elevation whence the Eleventh Corps had been driven. 
they also occupied the ridge on which Sickles had commenced to fight. Sickles himself was hors de combat, with a shattered leg which had to be amputated, and not far from 20,000 of our men had been killed, wounded, and captured. The rebels had also lost heavily, but, as they themselves believed, they were the winners. General Lee, in his official report, says, After a severe struggle, Longstreet succeeded in getting possession of and holding the desired ground. Ewell also carried some of the strong positions which he assailed, and the result was such as to lead to the belief that he would ultimately be able to dislodge the enemy. The battle ceased at dark. These partial successes determined me to continue the assault next day. During these days of deadly strife and of unprecedented slaughter, our cavalry was by no means idle. On the morning of the first, Kilpatrick advanced his victorious squadrons to the vicinity of Abbottstown, where they struck a force of rebel cavalry which they scattered, capturing several prisoners, and then rested. To the ears of the alert chieftain came the sound of battle at Gettysburg, accompanied with the intelligence, from prisoners mostly, that Stuart's main force was bent on doing mischief on the right of our infantry lines, which were not far from the knight's bivouac. He appeared instinctively to know where he was most needed. So, in the absence of orders, early the next morning he advanced to Hunterstown. At this point were the extreme wings of the infantry lines, and as Kilpatrick expected, he encountered the rebel cavalry, commanded by his old antagonists, Stuart, Lee, and Hampton. The early part of the day was spent mostly in reconnoitering, but all the latter part of the day was occupied in hard, bold, and bloody work. Charges and countercharges were made. The carbine, pistol, and saber were used by turns, and the artillery thundered even late after the infantry around Gettysburg had sunk to rest, well nigh exhausted with the bloody carnage of the weary day. But Stuart, who had hoped to break in upon our flank and rear and to pounce upon our trains, was not only foiled in his endeavor by the gallant Kilpatrick, but also driven back upon his infantry supports and badly beaten. In the night, Kilpatrick, after leaving a sufficient force to prevent Stuart from doing any special damage on our right, swung around with the rest of his troopers to the left of our line, near Round Top, and was there prepared for any work which might be assigned him. Friday, July 3rd. The sun rose bright and warm upon the blackened corpses of the dead, which were strewn over the bloody earth, upon the wounded who had not been cared for, and upon long, glistening lines of armed men ready to renew the conflict. Each antagonist, rousing every slumbering element of power, seemed to be resolved upon victory or death. The fight commenced early by an attack of General Slocum's men, who, determined to regain the rifle pits they had lost the evening before, descended like an avalanche upon the foe. The attack met with a prompt response from General Ewell, but after several hours of desperate fighting, victory perched upon the Union banners, and with great loss and slaughter the rebels were driven out of the breastworks and fell back upon their main lines near Benner's Hill. This successful move on the part of our boys in blue was followed by an ominous lull, or quiet, which continued about three hours. Meanwhile the silence was fitfully broken by an occasional spit of fire, while every preparation was being made for a last supreme effort which, it was expected, would decide the mighty contest. The scales were being poised for the last time, and upon the one side or the other was soon to be written, the Mene, Mene, Tekel, Uparsin. Hearts either trembled or waxed strong in the awful presence of this responsibility. At length one o'clock arrived, a signal gun was fired, and then at least 125 guns from Hill and Longstreet concentrated and crossed their fires upon Cemetery Hill, the center and key of our position. Just behind this crest, though much exposed, were General Meade's headquarters. For nearly two hours this hill was plowed and torn by solid shot and bursting shell, while about 100 guns on our side, mainly from this crest and round top, made sharp response. The earth and the air shook for miles around with the terrific concussion, which came no longer in volleys, but in a continual roar. 
so long and fearful a cannonade was never before witnessed on this continent. As the range was short and the aim accurate, the destruction was terrible. But the advantage was decidedly in favor of the rebels, whose guns were superior in number to ours, and of heavier caliber, and had been concentrated for the attack. A spectator of the Union Army thus describes the scene. The storm broke upon us so suddenly that soldiers and officers who leaped as it began from their tents or from lazy siestas on the grass were stricken in their rising with mortal wounds and died, some with cigars between their teeth, some with pieces of food in their fingers, and one at least, a pale young German from Pennsylvania, with a miniature of his sister in his hands. Horses fell, shrieking such awful cries as Cooper told of, and writhing themselves about in hopeless agony. The boards of fences, scattered by explosion, flew in splinters through the air. The earth, torn up in clouds, blinded the eyes of hurrying men, and through the branches of trees and among the gravestones of the cemetery, a shower of destruction crashed ceaselessly. As, with hundreds of others, I groped through this tempest of death for the shelter of the bluff, an old man, a private in a company belonging to the 24th Michigan, was struck scarcely ten feet away by a cannonball which tore through him, extorting such a low, intense cry of mortal pain as I pray God I may never again hear. The hill, which seemed alone devoted to this reign of death, was clear in nearly all its unsheltered places within five minutes after the fire began. A correspondent from the Confederate Army thus describes this artillery contest. I have never yet heard such tremendous artillery firing. The enemy must have had over 100 guns, which, in addition to our 115, made the air hideous with most discordant noise. The very earth shook beneath our feet, and the hills and rocks seemed to reel like a drunken man. For one hour and a half this most terrific fire was continued, during which time the shrieking of shell, the crash of fallen timbers, the fragments of rocks flying through the air, shattered from the cliffs by solid shot, the heavy mutterings from the valley between the opposing armies, the splash of bursting shrapnel, and the fierce neighing of wounded artillery horses, made a picture terribly grand and sublime, but which my pen utterly fails to describe. Gradually the fire on our side began to slacken, and General Meade, learning that our guns were becoming hot, gave orders to cease firing and to let the guns cool, though the rebel balls were making fearful havoc among our gunners, while our infantry sought poor shelter behind every projection, anxiously awaiting the expected charge. At length, the enemy, supposing that our guns were silenced, deemed that the moment for an irresistible attack had come. Accordingly, as a lion emerges from his lair, he sallied forth, when strong lines of infantry, nearly three miles in length, with double lines of skirmishers in front and heavy reserves in rear, advanced with desperation to the final effort. They moved with steady, measured tread over the plain below, and began the ascent of the hills occupied by our forces, concentrating somewhat upon General Hancock, though stretching across our entire front says a correspondent of the Richmond Inquirer. Just as Pickett was getting well under the enemy's fire, our batteries ceased firing. This was a fearful moment for Pickett and his brave command. Why do not our guns reopen their fire? Is the inquiry that rises upon every lip. Still, our batteries are silent as death. And this undoubtedly decided the issue. Was God's handwriting on the wall? The rebel guns had been thundering so long and ceaselessly that they were now unfit for use and ceased firing from very necessity. Agate, correspondent of the Cincinnati Gazette, gives the following graphic description of the struggle. The great, desperate, final charge came at four. The rebels seemed to have gathered up all their strength and desperation for one fierce, convulsive effort that should sweep over and wash out our obstinate resistance. They swept up as before, the flower of their army to the front, victory staked upon the issue. In some places they literally lifted up and pushed back our lines, but that terrible position of ours, wherever they entered it, 
infilating fires from half a score of crests swept away their columns like merest chaff. Broken and hurled back, they easily fell into our hands, and on the center and left, the last half hour brought more prisoners than all the rest. So it was along the whole line, but it was on the Second Corps that the flower of the rebel army was concentrated. It was there that the heaviest shock beat upon and shook, and even sometimes crumbled our lines. We had some shallow rifle pits, with barricades of rails from the fences, the rebel line stretching away miles to the left, in magnificent array but strongest here, Pickett's splendid division of Longstreet's corps in front, the best of A.P. Hill's veterans in support, came steadily, and as it seemed resistlessly, sweeping up. Our skirmishers retired slowly from the Emmitsburg Road, holding their ground tenaciously to the last. The rebels reserved their fire till they reached this same Emmitsburg Road, then opened with a terrific crash. From a hundred iron throats, meantime, their artillery had been thundering on our barricades. Hancock was wounded, Gibbon succeeded to the command, an approved soldier and ready for the crisis. As the tempest of fire approached its height, he walked along the line and renewed his orders to the men to reserve their fire. The rebels, three lines deep, came steadily up. They were in point-blank range. At last the order came. From thrice six thousand guns there came a sheet of smoky flame, a crash, a rush of leaden death. The line literally melted away, but there came the second, resistless still. It had been our supreme effort, on the moment we were not equal to another. Up to the rifle pits across them, over the barricades, the momentum of their charge, the mere machine strength of their combined actions swept them on. Our thin line could fight, but it had not weight enough to oppose to this momentum. It was pushed behind the guns. Right on came the rebels. They were upon our guns, were bayoneting the gunners, were waving their flags over our pieces. But they had penetrated to the fatal point. A storm of grape and canister tore its way from man to man and marked its track with corpses straight down their line. They had exposed themselves to the infilating fire of the guns on the western slope of Cemetery Hill. That exposure sealed their fate. The line reeled back, disjointed already, in an instant in fragments. Our men were just behind the guns. They leaped forward upon the disordered mass, but there was little need of fighting now. A regiment threw down its arms and, with colors at its head, rushed over and surrendered. All along the field, smaller detachments did the same. Webb's brigade brought in eight hundred, taken in as little time as it requires to write the simple sentence that tells it. Gibbon's old division took fifteen stand of colors. Over the fields, the escaped fragments of the charging line fell back. The battle there was over. A single brigade, Harrow's, of which the 7th Michigan is part, came out with fifty-four less officers and seven hundred and ninety-three less men than it took in. So the whole corps fought, so too they fought farther down the line. It was fruitless sacrifice. They gathered up their broken fragments, formed their lines, and slowly marched away. It was not a rout. It was a bitter, crushing defeat. For once the Army of the Potomac had won a clean, honest, acknowledged victory. General Pickett's division was nearly annihilated. One of his officers recounted that, as they were charging over the grassy plain, he threw himself down before a murderous discharge of grape and canister, which mowed the grass and men all around him, as Thawasaithi had been swung just above his prostrate form. During the terrific cannonade and subsequent charges, our ammunition and other trains had been parked in rear of Round Top, which gave them splendid shelter partly to possess this train, but mainly to secure this commanding position, General Longstreet sent two strong divisions of infantry, with heavy artillery, to turn our flank and to drive us from this ground. Kilpatrick, with his division, which had been strengthened by Merritt's regular brigade, was watching this point and waiting for an opportunity to strike the foe. It came at last. Emerging from the woods in front of him came a strong battle line followed by others. 
to the young Farnsworth was committed the task of meeting infantry with cavalry in an open field. Placing the 5th New York in support of Elder's battery, which was exposed to a galling fire, but made reply with characteristic rapidity, precision, and slaughter. Farnsworth quickly ordered the 1st Virginia, 1st Vermont, and 18th Pennsylvania in line of battle and galloped away and charged upon the flank of the advancing columns. The attack was sharp, brief, and successful, though attended with great slaughter. But the rebels were driven upon their main lines, and the flank movement was prevented. Thus the cavalry added another dearly earned laurel to its chaplet of honor. Dearly earned, because many of their bravest champions fell upon that bloody field. Kilpatrick, in his official report of this sanguinary contest, says, In this charge fell the brave Farnsworth. Short and brilliant was his career. On the 29th of June, a general. On the 1st of July, he baptized his star in blood, and on the 3rd, for the honor of his young brigade and the glory of his corps, he yielded up his noble life. Thus ended the Battle of Gettysburg, the bloody turning point of the rebellion, the bloody baptism of the redeemed republic. Nearly 20,000 men from the Union ranks had been killed and wounded, and a larger number of the rebels, making the enormous aggregate of at least 40,000, whose blood was shed to fertilize the Tree of Liberty. In the evening twilight of that eventful day, General Meade penned the following interesting dispatch to the government. Headquarters Army of the Potomac, near Gettysburg. July 3, 8.30 p.m. To Major General Halleck, General-in-Chief, the enemy opened at 1 o'clock p.m. from about 150 guns. They concentrated upon my left center, continuing without intermission for about three hours, at the expiration of which time he assaulted my left center twice, being, upon both occasions, handsomely repulsed with severe loss to them, leaving in our hands nearly 3,000 prisoners. Among the prisoners are Major General Armistead and many colonels and officers of lesser note. The enemy left many dead upon the field, and a large number of wounded in our hands. The loss upon our side has been considerable. Major General Hancock and Brigadier General Gibbon were wounded. After the repelling of the assault, indications leading to the belief that the enemy might be withdrawing an armed reconnaissance was pushed forward from the left, and the enemy found to be in force. At the present hour, all is quiet. The New York cavalry have been engaged all day on both flanks of the enemy, harassing and vigorously attacking him with great success. Notwithstanding, they encountered superior numbers, both of cavalry and artillery. The army is in fine spirits. George G. Meade, Major General Commanding. On the morning of the 4th of July, General Meade issued an address to the Army. Headquarters Army of the Potomac, near Gettysburg, July 4th. F. the Commanding General, in behalf of the country, thanks the Army of the Potomac for the glorious result of the recent operations. Our enemy, superior in numbers and flushed with the pride of a successful invasion, attempted to overcome or destroy this army. Utterly baffled and defeated, he has now withdrawn from the contest. The privations and fatigues the army has endured, and the heroic courage and gallantry it has displayed, will be matters of history to be ever remembered. Our task is not yet accomplished, and the commanding general looks to the army for greater efforts to drive from our soil every vestige of the presence of the invader. It is right and proper that we should, on suitable occasions, return our grateful thanks to the almighty disposer of events, that in the goodness of his providence he has thought fit to give victory to the cause of the just, by command of Major General Meade, S. Williams, A. A. General. It is fitting we should close this chapter with President Lincoln's brief yet comprehensive announcement to the country. Washington, D.C., July 4, 1863, 10th A.M. The President of the United States announces to the country that the news from the Army of the Potomac up to ten o'clock, M. of the Third, is such as to cover the Army with the highest honor, to promise great success to the cause of the Union, and to claim the condolence of all for the many gallant fallen, and that for this he especially desires that on this day 
He whose will, not ours, should ever be done, be everywhere remembered and reverenced with the profoundest gratitude. Abraham Lincoln, Retreat of the Rebels from Gettysburg. The victory at Gettysburg, though purchased at so dear a price, when announced to the people, produced a deep and widespread joy, which contributed to make the 4th of July doubly memorable. The gallant behavior of our men furnished a theme for general exultation, and the removal of the threatened disaster foreshadowed in the pompous and successful invasion made every true American breathe more freely. But the work of the soldier was not yet done. The feet of the invaders were still upon free soil, and though his ranks had been thinned by desertions and by unprecedented casualties in battle, and he had been thwarted in all the important minutiae of his plan, he was still formidable and compelled to fight with desperation, if attacked, to prevent utter destruction. Some apprehension that the enemy was at least contemplating a speedy retreat was entertained during the night that followed the third bloody day. General Pleasanton, chief of cavalry, urged General Meade to advance in force upon the beaten foe, alleging that they were not only greatly weakened by their losses, but undoubtedly demoralized, in consequence of repulse and probable scarcity of ammunition. To ascertain positively what could be of these probabilities, Pleasanton was directed to make a reconnaissance toward the rebel rear. Accordingly, several detachments of cavalry were thrust out on different roads, where they rode all night. General Gregg on our right went about twenty-two miles on the road to Chambersburg, and returning early on the morning of the 4th reported that the road was strewn with wounded and stragglers, ambulances and caissons, and general debris, which indicated that the enemy was retreating as rapidly as possible and was passing through a terrible season of demoralization. The testimony of the mute witnesses of disaster was corroborated by that of the many prisoners which easily fell into Gregg's hands. Other expeditions, returning later in the day, had similar reports to render of what they had seen and heard. And now came the time for energetic cavalry movements. While our infantry was resting or engaged in burying our own and the rebel dead within our lines, the cavalry was dispatched to do all possible damage to the retreating and demoralized Confederate columns. Kilpatrick, having assembled his old and oft-tried division on the plain at the foot of Round Top on the morning of the 4th, discoursed to them eloquently for a few moments on the interests of the times. He assured his men that their noble deeds were not passing by unnoticed, nor would they be unrequited, and that they were already a part of a grand history. He trusted that their future conduct would be a fair copy of the past. But his pathetic and patriotic accents had scarcely died upon the ear of his brave command when the shrill bugle blast brought eager men and grazing horses in line of march. Orders had been received by Kilpatrick to repair as swiftly as possible to the passes in the Catoctin Mountains, to intercept the enemy now known to be flying southward at a rapid rate. The command had gone but a short distance when rain began to fall in torrents, as is usually the case after great battles, especially when artillery of heavy caliber is used, but through mud, in places to the horses' bodies, through brooks swollen enormously and through the falling floods, the troopers pressed forward to the accomplishment of their task. About five o'clock P.M. Kilpatrick reached Emmitsburg, where he was joined by portions of General Gregg's command, including the Harris Light, which had been kept mostly in reserve during the conflicts of the past few days. Thus reinforced, this intrepid leader marched directly towards the Monterey Pass, arriving at the foot of this rocky defile in the mountains in the midst of pitchy darkness. As was anticipated, a heavy rebel train was then trying to make its escape through the gorge, guarded by Stuart's cavalry, with light artillery. This artillery was planted in a position to rake the narrow road upon which Kilpatrick was advancing. But the darkness was so intense that the guns could be of little use, except to make the night terribly hideous with their bellowings, the echoes of which reverberated in the mountain gorges in a most frightful manner. To add to the horrors of the scene and position, the rain fell in floods, accompanied with groaning thunders, while lightnings flashed from cloud to cloud over our heads, 
and cleft the darkness only to leave friend and foe enveloped in greater darkness in the intervals of light. By these flashes, however, we gained a momentary glimpse of each other's position, and as we dashed forward in the gloom, we were further directed by the fire of the artillery and the desultory fire of the cavalry. Surgeon Moore gives the following account of this affair. We do not hesitate in saying, and have good reason to know, that had any want of firmness on the part of the leader, or any indecision or vacillation appeared, and a mischance occurred, this splendid command would then and there have been lost. But with unflinching and steady purpose, bold bearing, and a mind equal to the emergency, the general rode to the head of the column, reassured his frightened people, and, notwithstanding the intense darkness that hid friend from foe, made such skillful dispositions, and then attacked the hidden foe with such impetuosity that he fled in will dismay, leaving his guns a battle flag and four hundred prisoners in the victor's hands. The pass was Guy Ned, and Pennington's and Elder's guns were soon echoing and re-echoing through the mountain defiles. The artillery opened thus on the flying columns of the routed foe, who, with wagons, ambulances, caissons, and the debris of a shattered army, were rushing in chaotic confusion down the narrow mountain road and scattering through the fields and woods on the plains below. All night long Kilpatrick and his successful followers were, gathering the spoils of their evening work. Wagon after wagon was overtaken, captured, and destroyed, while hundreds of prisoners were easily captured. This daring exploit placed Kilpatrick in advance of the rebel army, giving him a fine opportunity to obstruct their pathway of retreat and to destroy whatever could be of any use to them. Had he not been cumbered with so many prisoners, it is not in the power of anyone to estimate the damage he would have done. In his official report he says, On this day I captured 1,860 prisoners, including many officers of rank, and destroyed the rebel General Ewell's immense wagon train, nine miles long. It should be stated that these wagons were mostly laden with the ripened and gathered crops of Pennsylvania and Maryland, and with the plunder of private and public stores, including dry goods and groceries of every variety and quality. None who saw it will ever forget the appearance of that mountain road the day following this night's foray. Stuart, who was ingloriously defeated at Monterey, rhetored towards Emmitsburg with about fifty prisoners that he had captured during and after the fight. He then moved southward until he struck an unfrequented road which leads over the mountain via Wolf's Tavern. By this turn he avoided immediate contact with our cavalry. But about five o'clock p.m., as he was about to debouch into the valley, Kilpatrick, who was watching for him as a cat does a mouse, attacked him with artillery and fought him till dark. This fight occurred near Smithburg, whence the prisoners in Kilpatrick's hands were sent to South Mountain, guarded by the Harris Light. Darkness having put an end to the contest, Kilpatrick marched through Cave Town to Boonesboro, where he bivouacked for the night. Stuart, it was ascertained, marched till about midnight to the small town of Leitersburg, where he rested his worn and wearied command. His condition was really pitiable. A large number of his men were mounted on shoeless horses, whose leanness showed that they had made many a long march through and from Virginia. Or, as was the case with a large proportion of them, they had fat horses, which were stolen from the fields and stalls of the invaded states, but being entirely unused to such hard and cruel treatment as they were now receiving, were well-nigh unserviceable. Lameness and demoralization were prominent characteristics among animals and men. July 6th. This morning at an early hour, Kilpatrick's crowd of prisoners were turned over into the hands of General French, and then his command marched too. Hagerstown, taking possession of the place in advance of Stuart, whose approach about eleven o'clock was met with determined resistance, and at first with great success. A heavy battle was fought, in which Kilpatrick's men showed their usual prowess and strength. Had not rebel infantry come to the aid of his cavalry, Stuart would have suffered a stunning blow. For several hours the contest was wholly between cavalry and light artillery. Charges of great daring and skill were made. One reporter says, 
Elder gave them grape and canister and the 5th New York Sabres, while the 1st Vermont used their carbines. In one of those charges, made in the face of a very superior force, Captain James A. Penfield of the 5th New York, at the head of his company, had his horse killed under him, and while struggling to extricate himself from the animal, which lay upon him in part, he was struck a fearful blow of a saber on the head, which came near severing it in twain. Thus wounded, with blood streaming down upon his long beard and clothes, he was made a prisoner. In a similar charge, the gallant Captain Ulrich Dahlgren lost a leg, though not his valuable life. It appeared as though the rebels were afforded an opportunity to avenge themselves in part for the shameful losses which they had sustained in this very place by the strategic operations of a Union scout, by the name of C. A. Phelps, during the incipient step of the invasion. We will let the scout relate his own story, which is corroborated by a signal officer, who, from one of the lofty peaks of the mountains, witnessed the exciting denouement. The scout proceeds to say, I was very anxious to learn all about General Stewart's force and contemplated movements, and resolved to see the general himself or some of his staff officers soon after he entered Hagerstown. Accordingly, I procured of a Union man a suit of rags, knocked off one boot heel to make one leg appear shorter than the other, and put a gimlet, a toe-string, and an old broken jackknife in my pockets. My jewelry corresponded with my clothes. I adopted the name of George Fry, a harvest hand of Dr. Farney from Wolftown, on the north side of the mountain, and I was a cripple from rheumatism. Having completed arrangements with Dr. Farney, Mr. Landers, and other Union men, that they might be of service to me in case the rebels should be suspicious of my character, I hobbled away on my perilous journey and entered the city by leaping the high stone wall which guards it on the north side near the depot. This occurred just as the town clock struck one. It was a clear starlight night, and the glistening sabers of the sentries could be seen as they walked their lonely beat. Scarcely had I gained the sidewalk leading to the center of the town, when the sentry nearest me cried, Halt! Who goes there? A friend, I replied, a friend to north or south. To the south, of course, and all right. Advance, then, was the response. On reaching him, he asked me what could be my business at this hour of the night. I told him I had come in to see our brave boys, who could whip the Yankees so handsomely, as they had done especially at Bull Run and Chancellorsville. We fell at once to the discussion of the war questions of the day. In the midst of our colloquy up came the officer of the guard on his grand rounds, who, after probing me thoroughly, as he thought with many questions, finally said, Had you not better go with me to see General Stuart? I should really like to get a sight of the ginral, I quickly replied, for I never seen a real ginral in all my life. I was soon in the presence of the general, who received me very cordially. I found him to be a man a little above the medium height and fine-looking. His features are very distinct in outline, his nose long and sharp, his eye keen and restless. His complexion is florid and his manners affable. I told him who I was and where I lived when at home. Wolf Town, exclaimed the general. Have not the Yankees a large wagon train there? I told him they had, and then, turning to one of his staff officers, he said, I must have it. It would be a fine prize. I noted his words and determined if I possessed any Yankee wit to make use of it on this occasion. Gin rail, said I. You all don't think of capturing them or Yankee wagons, do you? Why not? I have here five thousand cavalry and sixteen pieces of artillery, and I understand the train is lightly guarded. I saw that he had been properly informed, and I told him they came there last evening with twelve big brass cannon and three regiments of foot soldiers, and if he was to try to go through the gap of the mountain, they would shoot all the cannon off right in the gap and kill all his horses and men. The general smiled at my naive answer and said, I had a strange idea of war if I thought so many men would be killed at once, and added that I would not be a very brave soldier. I replied that many times I had felt like going into the Confederate army, but my rheumatism kept me out. 
After a while, the general concluded not to try the train, and I was heartily glad, for he would have taken at least two hundred wagons easily, as they were guarded by not more than three hundred men. He then gave orders to have the main body of his cavalry move towards Green Castle, and I distinctly heard him give orders to the major to remain in town with fifty men as rear guard, and to send on the army mail, which was expected there about six the next evening. I made up my mind that it would be a small mail he would get, as I proposed to myself to be postmaster for once. After seeing the general and his cavalry move out of town, I went directly for my horse, which I had concealed in a safe place some distance from the city, meanwhile surveying the ground to see which way I could best come in to capture the mail, and determined to charge the place on the pike from Boonesboro, and made my arrangements to that effect. I got a Union man by the name of Thornburg to go into the town and notify the Union people that, when the town clock struck 6 p.m., I would charge in and capture the rebel mail, at the risk of losing my own life and every man with me. I had now but eight men, two having been sent to General Stahel with dispatches, 